Okay, members. Uh, good afternoon. We're now in public session, uh, and I welcome you to the Public Accounts Committee. Members, mobile phones must be set to airplay mode or turned off. It's not sufficient for mobile phones to be on silent, as they continue to interfere with the assembly recording. This session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed live via either streaming or the assembly website or Democracy Live. Public session item agenda number one is apologies. And Clark. Um, apologies from Melissa, Melissa McHugh and David Hilditch. Okay. To get there, no other apologies, members. Uh, agenda item two then is minutes of the 22nd of October 2020, which in your table pack pages four to nine. Uh, are members content with these? Can I have your permission to sign the minutes? Sure, there's just a wee typo, but I've not we type on one of the paragraphs. Listen to the autism group. Okay. okay. Item three. Declaration of members' interest. Okay. It's relating to you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But other than that, you're happy to sign them. And, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item three then is the declaration of members' interests. Members at each meeting, members are required to register relevant financial or other interests in the members' registers of interest. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Mr. Muir. Thank you. My stepfather is a former employee of Lagging Construction, and that relates to the major capital projects, University of Ulster Belfast campus. Okay. Any others? Okay. So, agenda item four, matters arising uh, in your packs, pages eight to one hundred and three. Um, members are referred to correspondence dated twenty first of October from Sue Gray, the accounting officer, permanent secretary of the Department of Finance, which is in your packs, page eight to forty four, in response to the committee's letter of the second of October, twenty twenty, requesting further information from the evidence session on the twenty fourth of September. Uh, this correspondence was put to the committee in our meeting uh, on the 22nd of October. However, it was received late and members were not given sufficient time prior to the meeting. So I asked if you remember that it would be deferred to today. Um, so do any members have any comments or questions around that? Are members content? Uh, Mr Beggs. There were a couple of um, projects where it was very evident there's nobody named as being responsible. You know, they, the majority of the more recent ones are still as a named individual with the responsibility of renewing. And I'm just surprised there are some major contracts with nobody's name against it to on, go on for ongoing monitoring purposes. Okay, well, I've, I have no difficulty that and, uh, if you want to make a proposal that we write and ask for those names. It, we were told that somebody would be, yeah, just, yeah, yes. I think for completeness, no, somebody I, should I, have I, responsibility. I, I, I have absolutely no difficulty around that. Okay, members agreed? Great. Any others? Okay, thank you. Members are re referred to correspondence dated the 22nd of October 2020 from Sue Gray um, in your pack pages 45 to 103 regarding copies of the Northern Ireland Strategic Direct Strategic Partner Project accounts covering the period 2012-13 to 29-20 prepared by uh, CMG Chartered Accountants. Um, are members content with these? Mr. Banks. The, the, the issue again, I'm just through the audit office, uh, uh, by my, um, <coughs> is there sufficient detail to actually um, delve into the level of profit that was being made? I mean, is, it, is, there, is there sufficient information there, uh, or can it mask improper activity? Mr. Donnelly, Controller General. Yes, yeah. thank you, Chair. Um, well, I suppose... There's a lot of material there. If you cut through it all, it's showing, uh, I suppose, a rate of return between 3 and 8 per cent, more or less what Paul Duffy had said in evidence at the session. Uh, the more interesting thing, though, is if you look at the dates of the, the audit certificate, they're all dated 2020. Uh, yet some of the accounts are actually 
14, 15, 15, 16. So what's that telling you? That nobody was looking at this stuff. So even if they had the provision for open book accounting uh, in the contract, now they did on this one, they didn't have on land web, but uh, my sense of it is uh, nobody was looking at it. Uh, and then you get all this stuff in uh, okay, well, I think, you know, a number of years I, I, later. I think that's a very valid point. And I think um, that having been raised and brought to our attention, that we should write and ask as to why that, that was the case. If, the, if there were some accounts that were stretching back six years, you know, why, are, why they did it this year instead of 2014? Uh, hey, members? Agreed? Mr. Donnelly, do you want to make another point? No, it's just a little added point. Uh, I've incorporated that point in the separate paper on the, the briefing, or the, uh, the issues paper. So the idea was we, we can capture that as well uh, um, already in, the, in your report. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. Okay, members, moving on then. I refer to correspondence dated the 3rd of November 2020 from Mr. Donnelly in his role as Comptroller and Auditor General tabled in your packs 11 and 12 uh, regarding further information on the increase in the main estimate of 5.1% for 2021-22 is significantly higher than the main estimate proposals of 22-23 and 23-24. Mr Donnelly um, is happy to provide more information. Mr Donnelly, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, can I just maybe give the context to this, Chair? Uh, it's the Audit Committee of the Assembly is responsible for, uh, I suppose, the budget of my office, but part of the convention and the protocol is uh, they will always have a, an engagement with the Public Accounts Committee. So uh, uh, if you have any comments on, on my budget in terms of I'm a well enough resource to do the work that's brought to this committee. Um, uh, our budget had gone down quite significantly during the years of austerity, so we're, we're building it back up again. So there's de I'll give detailed reasons in, in, in the letter uh, as to w why there's a bit of a kink in the first year. So it's 5% the first year, but then it drops back in the next two years to more like I can't open the thing here, my computer's stuck. 2% uh, or 1% in year two, year three. Um, there's a couple of factors that uh, come into that. Um, one of the big audits that we do is on European Agricultural Fund Audit. It's a, a, a subcontracted audit for the National Audit Office. And with, um, uh, with Brexit, uh, there's uncertainty as to what happens with that. So that's an income flow that we have at the minute. It's quite substantial. It's a few, quite a few hundred thousand. So that income line will, will reduce uh, over the next couple of years. That's one of the factors that's, that's in there. I, I suppose you just don't know the answers in terms of going forward with Brexit, <coughs> and, uh, the uh, situation vis vis agriculture and so on, as to when that will come to an end. If that comes to an end, you have no time scale. There's a massive amount of uncertainty on that. Uh, so there, what we understand is there'd be transitional arrangements for a couple of years. Yeah. So this is work uh, we do. Um, we're subcontractors to suppose, the National Audit Office, and um, uh, it's work that's done over all the, the UK regions uh, that's required under EU rules. Uh, so the EU has confidence on... Um, uh, I suppose EU funds. So, okay. with um, with Brexit, uh, there, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to what happens there. But uh, there'll be transitional arrangements for a couple of years. But there'll be likely less work in that area and less income. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any member, Mr. <coughs> Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask, um, if I may, um, Kieran, on that point about um, EU funds. Given we're going to continue to be a participant in Peace Plus. And there are areas. In, can you hear me? Okay. And there are areas in which um, we, unlike other parts of the UK, are going to still be recipients of certain types of EU funding. Obviously, the we don't know exactly how the funding will be replaced. Various structural and social mm -hmm. funding is going to be replaced. But would you anticipate a specific strand of work on that that is different from across the water? Uh, just to separate a few things out, uh, the particular audit I was talking about relates purely to the agriculture funds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's separate arrangements for that. Um, all EU funds actually flow through government accounts, so I audit them anyway. Yeah. 
Uh, but this was an additional layer of audit on the agricultural side uh, that was requested by the EU that, that we do. Uh, we also audit all the other structural funds, the peace funds, uh, the ESF, uh, and that money flows through normal government accounts. Uh, so we, we have no role in doing any additional work for the EU on those funds. Is that, is that, that, that explain it? Yeah. Okay, everyone else content then? Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, agenda item five then is correspondence, pages 104 to 131. Members refer you to correspondence from Mr. Edward Cook in relation to the impact of COVID-19 on universities and students in your packs, pages 104 to 119. Uh, the emails are dated the 22nd of October times three. 24, 25, 26th of October and the 30th of October 2020 times two. Are members content to note? Agreed. Agreed? Thank you. Members, I refer to correspondence dated the 22nd of October 2020 from Marie McHugh regarding CCNI in your pack pages 120 to 125. This has already been sent to the Northern Ireland Audit Office. Are members content to note? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, members are referred to correspondence dated the 23rd of October from Sharon O'Connor, Chairperson of the Education uh, Authority, in your pack of pages 126 regarding the date of her evidence session. Are you content that Ms O'Connor gives evidence at our meeting on the 19th of November 2020 and that Mr Gavin Boyd, the previous Chief Executive of the Education Authority, will attend this session? Agreed? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Members, I refer again to Ms O'Connor's letter on the 23rd of October 2020 regarding her forthcoming evidence session. In it, she refers to strict confidential HR process and GDPR issues within the EA's uh, current internal investigation. Ms O'Connor has stated she will not be able to discuss the investigation as it would contravene GDPR regulations and would be prejudicial to the process of fairness in these processes. Are members content? Is it important then that members do not stray into the questioning around that issue because obviously the answers will not be given? Um, Mr Donnelly, have you any comment you want to make on any of those issues? Uh, it's just that there will be an awful lot of other questions that can be asked to Sharon O'Connor yes. uh, as about uh, you know, uh, the narrower ground of HR is sort of trumped by the, the wider issues of real big problems in, yeah. in SEN uh, and how the authority is sort of run generally. So there's an awful lot you can ask for. Uh, I think you'd be perfectly entitled to, to ask, uh, when is this HR process going to be complete? Because uh, we know from other cases like Sport NI, some of these things went into the ether and gone on for, for years. So even you made the point, it's important that there's yeah. expedition in these. So there may be just a, tr yes, the HR aspects need to be closed, uh, but uh, they're unusually closed here. Uh, it's not even given when the process will be complete. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, now when all that process is complete, uh, you're perfectly entitled to get into that territory at some later yes, stage, if you, if you so wish. Yep, I have asked as to when it would be complete uh, or completed, but I haven't managed to get an answer. Uh, and uh, that's why this committee unanimously and the Education Committee unanimously have reached the point of suggesting that an independent investigation or inquiry needs to be held around these issues. Uh, and uh, because I would be concerned that whilst there is a threat of um, around the HR issues and potential litigations and so on, that we will not get a conclusion to this internal investigation, which does not provide uh, the certainty and confidence that, that the parents and children out there need around the issue of special educational needs. That, that is something which is hugely important. And we have more and more children every year who are uh, requiring that specialised help. And we need uh, to have that confidence and that certainty uh, provided around that specialism. Just to chair, I, I take it, Chair, there's a financial consequence as well. I mean, not in the final analysis, but as this process runs on. In what sense? Uh, in terms of, well, the longer the process runs on, is there not a financial cost to all of that? 
Uh, well, of course there is. Um, the report we did on another entity, Sport, uh, uh, there were various investigations that he added them all up, there were about three point something million. No, no, I so so uh, where there is sort of a breakdown uh, in sort of, let's say, relationships, they're quite costly to clean up. And um, I suppose there, was, there were lessons from the Sport case on uh, just how... Uh, Public bodies actually deal with this stuff, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, some of the HR investigations haven't been the most professional. So now, while there's a confidentiality around this, when it's all over, you, you know, uh, it, it would be a legitimate enough area for the committee to get into. You yeah. know. And it's just uh -huh. asked in the context of trying to act, act, I know it has to follow a process. But trying to expedite the money, you know, that's yeah. That I, I, I think the difficulty is that um, we're then going into the realms of the HR stuff and litigations and all of that, and, and, and I'm not sure at the moment how you expedite that. That's the problem. Oh, no, yeah. no, I, I'm, and, sorry, and I'm, I'm just thinking the yeah. public purse. I mean, uh, in terms right, of right, uh, I'm in two minds on a lot of this stuff. Uh, sometimes, um, the public service is very risk averse, tightly you know, take, take hard decisions. And then you've heard sometimes you hear of things like compromise agreements where, yes. where there's a payoff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there, there, there may be different views on it. Your counterparts in Westminster, uh, PAC over there, uh, came down in compromise agreements because there were some very high cost ones. On the other hand, you want a clean break and bring in new management. So you could justify a case. Uh, and in Northern Ireland, um, I haven't seen too many of those uh, compared to across the water. Uh, but uh, and you have to look at you know, public. You shouldn't be paying over the odds on that. But at at the same time. <laughs> I've seen uh, cases here, had they been, say, in, in England, uh, they'd been sorted out 10 times more quickly. So if there was a need to actually change management, it would have been done very expeditiously. Uh, here, uh, there's more risk aversion in it and things tend to drag out. And uh, there's almost a fear of, um, maybe excessive fear of tribunals, and, uh, but things don't get sorted out as quickly as they should. Okay. Yeah, is that yeah, that's, that's just fine. my yeah, take on it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, members, then it, can I refer you to correspondence from uh Sarah Long, the <coughs> chief executive of the Education Authority, dated the fourth of November. Mm -hmm. Um Sir Long apologizes that she cannot provide the information requested by the committee until the eleventh of November. Members can tend to note. Yeah. No. Um members are referred to correspondence dated the twenty ninth of October twenty twenty <coughs> from Mike Brennan, the uh counting officer and permanent secretary Department of the Economy in your packet, page 127, regarding attendance at an evidence session on the general electricity from renewable energy, and sorry, generating electricity from renewable energy on the 3rd of December 2020. Mr. Brennan is requesting that the evidence session is deferred to the end of January 21 due to pressures uh, that he is under and his department is under in terms of uh, EU exit deadline and COVID-19. Uh, can I suggest, members, that we discuss that in the forward work programme? Is that okay? Agreed. Okay. Um, members are referred to correspondence to the 29th of October 2020 from uh, Mr. John Walsh, Board of Governors, St Mary's High School, Brola, in your packs, at pages 128 to 131, which was sent to Sarah Long at the Education Authority. This is in respect to Mr Walsh's concerns regarding scrutiny of schools' finances. These concerns include the erection of a perimeter fence without approval of the EA. Um, have members any comments on that? Um, are you content then to write to Mr Walsh to inform him that his concerns have been noted and that the letter will be forwarded to the Northern Ireland Audit Office subject to his agreement? Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. <clears throat> Members are referred to correspondence on the 2nd of uh, November 2020 from uh, Mr Derek Baker, um, the former accounting officer and permanent secretary of Department of Education, who I think retired on Monday, uh, which is in your table pack, pages 14 to 15. This is in response to our letter of the 21st of October, seeking additional information on special education needs 
SEN budget forecast for 2016 and pre-2016 following the SEN evidence session on the 15th of October. Are members content to note? Great. Okay. Okay, members, so we then uh, will begin, as I've said, in open session to hear evidence from Mr. Mike Brennan, the accounting officer of the Department of the Economy, regarding the uh, Ulster University Belfast Campus Capital Project. Uh, and then, members, we may well move into closed session to discuss more sensitive issues. Are members agreed? Agreed. Okay. So, agenda item six, then, is uh, the briefing with Mike Brennan, the accounting <coughs> officer and acting permanent secretary of the Department of the Economy regarding the Ulster University report on major capital projects in your PAC, pages 133 to 166. Uh, you will note that Mr Brennan is before us, and whilst we have uh, produced the report, his appearance here was delayed due to COVID pressures, uh, and that was agreed and understood by the committee. So at this stage, I would invite Mr Brennan, uh, the accounting officer at the Department of the Economy, Mr Michael Donnelly, the Strategic Investment Board, Professor Paul Bartholomew, Vice Chancellor of the Ulster University, to the table. Ms. Heather Cousins, Deputy Secretary for Skills and Group Education. Mr. Philip Crummy, Head of Higher Education in the Department of the, Econo uh, Department of the Economy, will be joining the meeting remotely. Um, and Mr. Kieran Donnelly, the Comptroller and Auditor General, and Mr. Patrick Barr from the Northern Ireland Audit Office will also join the meeting. Can I just check uh, if um, those who are joining us remotely can hear us? Um, um, Mr. Crummy, uh, Ms. Cousins, can you hear us okay? Yeah, and we can hear you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, gentlemen. You're very welcome. Thank Sorry to keep you. you. Uh, we had some housekeeping to deal with there uh, before we uh, could come to you. So you're very welcome, and I'll hand over to you to make statements, and then members will ask questions. If there are issues that, that you would prefer to deal with and can't answer in open session because of the sensitivities and because of uh, um, confidential nature, that's fully understood and we will deal with those in closed session. So, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to you and your committee to come along today and just give you um, an update on where we are with the, um, the Greater Belfast development. Um, a lot has happened since um, my last appearance here back in, in March. And, and I have to say, um, a lot of the developments are very, very positive, and we'll get into the detail of that over the next few hours or so. Um, as I say, lots of developments, um, positive developments, and the executive has been briefed extensively on that over the, the last few months. And it has agreed a, a series of actions and support that we'll get into the detail of um, as we walk through where we are now. Um, the Economy Minister uh, is also considering um, a number of papers, and um, it's anticipated that that will be provided to the Economy Committee um, in the, the next few weeks, just to update them on this. As we progress through this session, um, you will see that the, the mechanics of a recovery programme um, are now in place, and uh, my, my own sense from the Department for the Economy perspective is that the university is now heading in the right direction in terms of financial control and finishing out the Greater Belfast development. Um, we'll obviously get into the detail of the external reviews uh, and the findings of those reviews, and, and Paul will obviously take you through the detail of the work that he has in progress at the minute in terms of addressing some of the um, findings from the external uh, <coughs> consultants' reports. Um, as you say, Chair, some of the issues are quite sensitive from a finance and HR perspective, um, so we'll tread delicately on them as, as, we, as we move into the session. Um, Michael Donnelly also um, will be able to give uh, the committee uh, uh, insight into where we are in terms of the financials and give an assessment of where we are in terms of the project itself, in terms of delivery and remaining risks. And as you say, Chair, I also have two colleagues from the Department, Heather Cousins, who heads up the Higher Education Group, and Philip Crummy, who is looking after this specific project in the Department, and they can help in getting into some of the governance and accountability issues that will undoubtedly come up. So I'll maybe just pause there, Chair, if you're content, and ask Paul to make some observations. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to appear before the committee today and to offer my thoughts as a new Vice-Chancellor at Ulster University on the, on the Greater Belfast Development. 
Firstly, I think uh, I, I do need to say that I think that the Belfast campus project represents a hugely significant investment for the future of Ulster University and indeed for uh, the economy of uh, Northern Ireland. And although the project has had some difficulties, they've now been well mitigated through the collaborative working that we've had with DfE and SIB. And as a con consequence of that, I'm confident that we're in a good place now. Today, uh, I'll be able to discuss with you the underpinning issues that led to the delays uh, in the build and the implications that this had on the cost of the building and indeed the impact on the overall project. I'll be able to share the approaches that the university took to resolve the issues we encountered and how we did that in partnership with our colleagues in DfE and SIB. I hope I'll be able to give some assurances in relation to where we are uh, now and give the committee some updates in, in how we've dealt with and continue to deal with the current COVID-19 context. Um, as was alluded to by, by the Chair, I trust that members will understand it's very much a live project and there are some sensitivities around the commercial and legal aspects of the project. Uh, and while I'm very happy to answer any questions that members might have, I might uh, need to put some thoughts if it relates to extreme detail to the Chair subsequent to the session or if we go into closed session, I'd be able to give um, some, some uh, summary detail in relation to those things. But finally, I'd want to give an assurance to the committee in terms of the institutional learning that's happened, especially as it relates to our participation in the views that were uh, enacted with us through um, the conditions precedent to draw down of the SIB uh, loan. And I look forward to our discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Um, Professor Merthon, we can I ask in terms of what steps uh, and processes did the university take to address the issues that you, you alluded to in your uh, statement there in terms of the, the challenges, the financial challenges, whether they be contractual or whatever, uh, to, to, to ensure that the project stayed on track and is on the road to completion? Thank you. Thanks for the question. It, it, it's it's multi-phased, actually, depending on where we were in, in, in the project. It has quite a complex uh, history. Uh, there's a history that, that relates to the initial um, build prior to 2017. Uh, whereby the, the, the project was uh, segmented into a couple of parts with a, um, excavations into the, the, the ground and the subsequent uh, superstructure. So um, when we found that we had uh, defects in the, the basement and being able to conclude that work, the university took steps to try to uh, ensure that we had a completable project. That meant working closely with the contractors in order to ensure that we could maintain a golden thread through the build. That golden thread meant that we had a contractor that was able to stand over the quality and completion of the project in its totality for the life of the project. So we worked hard in relation to, to, to that. That required a point in its history that we entered into a, a, a settlement agreement as one contractor took over, if you like, the work of another. Uh, additional to that, one of the, that, the, the contractors that I refer to in that case was a, a, a joint camp company of two contractors, one of which went into administration in uh, 2018, and again that required us to go into some, some negotiations to ensure that we preserved that um, golden thread. So in relation to some of the security of the, the, the building, the work that we had to do uh, was about being forward-looking. Uh, and, and ensuring that we maintained a viable build project. I think through that time that there, there would have been, I, I, I suppose, some um, cultural propensity at the, at the university to ensure that contractors were held to the, the letter of the, of the contract. I think that we learned through that process that that probably wasn't the best way to uh, complete a, a project. And we certainly uh, shifted with the help of, of colleagues and, and, and building a bit of a new team uh, around that, that working with contractors, avoiding uh, adjudications and so forth, was the way to get a, a project built. Since we've changed tack and have been in that zone, we've had um, no disputes. We've had a really good relationship with the remaining contractor who continues to do an outstanding job, actually, in um, building the building through to completion even taking into account the recent COVID-19 uh, context, they stay and have stayed active on site. So to summarize, we made some changes within the um, 
the team. We brought in a dedicated um, senior project director uh, support. We changed our, the way in which we related to our um, contractor. And crucially, with the funding elements of the, the project, we've built, built much better relationships with um, DFE and indeed the, the, the funders, uh, SIB. Okay. Mr. Brennan, can I ask, at, um, at the time of writing the Northern Ireland Audit Office report uh, projected that there was a substantial overspend, the cost had risen from £245 million to £363.9 million. Can the department provide details on whether there is any further increase to these costs, or do you project that to be that which is projected here uh, to be the final cost? So, Chair, the position at the minute is that the work that, as Paul referred to, that has pro progressed since December of last year, has identified that there is an ask somewhere in the order of 125 million pounds of what's called financial transactions capital. That ask. Um, has been um, examined in considerable detail by <coughs> Department of Finance, SIB, ourselves, and um, the various external consult consultants and advisors. So um, we are pretty confident that that is all that is required. Now, there are some variations. So, for example, um, as I mentioned, the initial presumption um, when I was with this committee back in March was that that £125 million pounds would all be financial transactions capital. Um, the executive has decided that to, um, given the, con the COVID context, to make £25 million pounds of conventional capital Dell available, which would reduce the amount of financial transaction capital that the university would require um, to finish out the project. You say, for, the, for those who don't have the Whitehall code book, uh, financial transaction capital it's is a, a loan? It's essentially a loan, yes. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. It's a, yeah. it's a loan that the university would have to repay. So the executive would actually uh, substitute some of that loan for uh, convex conventional grants. Um, all the work to date yes, that, as Paul says, the contractors are on, on time, on schedule. And Michael can maybe go into some of the detail on that um, shortly. But um, we expect the project to finish out as planned, and nothing has been signalled to us in terms of cost escalation. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Michael? Uh, not at this point, Chair, unless you have any further okay. specific questions. Okay, Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and you are very welcome. Just a couple of points, and as the conversation develops, maybe the Chair will let me back in later. But just start it, and, and just in terms of the public spend, I mean, can you break that down, make in terms of cost public and cost borrowing, and what has been paid back? Right, so the, um, the total finished out costs will be somewhere in the order of £370 million. And um, to finish out at that level, um, the university will require um, £125 million of money from the ex public expenditure from the executive to finish that out. So, as I say, back in March time, it was envisaged that that £125 million would all be a loan. Um, but the executive, in the recognition of the pressures of COVID, um, decided that it was content to input 25 million of grant money, which would leave really 100 million of FTC. So that 125 is all public expenditure. Okay. But 100 of it would be a loan that would be repaid. Right, and because Maureen needs to ask the question, I appreciate the figures. I was just, in, in, you indicated that you'd gone the, it had gone the wrong way, the project had gone the wrong way about it. So it's about ensuring public confidence now and public spend. Mm -hmm. And what have you, what he has done in this process to ensure in the future that this project will instill public confidence in public spend, give, given the reasons why the, the, the projects and the, and the audit office report and all that has went with it. Sure, thank you. Part of that settlement agreement, uh, it, w a, a, as we found ourselves in a position with a, with a single co contractor, is a very strong contract with a, with a uh, fixed, fixed cost in, in relation to that. So we have a very <coughs> secure contract in, in that regard. Um, in terms of w where we're going, we have um, very strong project monitoring. We have contingency arrangements in place that sit within the um, budget, budget, budget envelope. We have conducted scenario planning in relation to the um, COVID-19 context uh, going forwards and projecting that, that forwards. Of course, for us, there's the project and there's the build, and it's, they're not quite the same thing. 
Uh, the project for Oxford University involves two campuses, really, the Jordanstown campus and the Belfast campus, with the migration of, of one to another, and some of the expenditure in, in, in what is the... Uh, the entire uh, budget of, of it's actually 357.9 million uh, that we would anticipate being the full cost of, 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 of the budget. About 260 million of that is in the construction of the building that people would, would, would look at and think that that's, that's the build and the, the other uh, costs in relation to the project relate to uh, other elements of the, of, of, of the project. Some of the uh, remaining risk for us is in, 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 that, in that move, especially as, as we look to the numbers of workers that we can get on uh, site going forwards. Um, but we have done um, four different scenarios going forwards to ensure that we can sequence our move into that. And for all of those scenarios, um, they, they project to stay within that, that budget. As of today, I'm uh, very confident that we will stay within the uh, allotted budget. Okay, thank you. I just, Mike, just you, you said, you know, you may be able to answer this, but I'll, I'll put it in terms of, you said um, there's a number of papers to go to the economy, economy minister. Can you elaborate on that? Or? So the, there are papers um, produced by the consultants, Alvarez and Marcel that were brought in to evaluate the project and the, the university's interface with the delivery of that project. So that report has been presented to the department, so it's with the minister at the minute. Um, we have been giving the economy committee briefing sessions on this project, so we would envisage that the papers would be made available to the committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Flynn. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so, firstly, um, just around the repayments um, of the financial transaction capital loan, um, I'm conscious that the first payment um, of 5.25 million was made in August 2018 and then another, another in August 2019. Um, so, my question would be, are you confident that the university can sustain these payments um, into the future? And I know you had already referenced, obviously, the COVID-19 Endemic. I'm not sure um, with the you know the scenario that we're in. Um, are you concerned that there might be maybe further or, or unforeseen issues for the project now, given the, the context of the, the pandemic and maybe possible other financial um, you know troubles that you might have? Right. Well, um, the allocation of the loan funding to the to the university by the executive um, built in some some uh, flexibility, shall we say, to make um, it more comfortable for the university to live with. So, for example, um, there will be a repayment holiday of five years. So for the first five years, the university can settle into the new, the new accommodation. They won't be making any payments for five years. And on whatever FTC element they do get, um, if it's the 100 million, um, the interest rate on that is very, very small. As I understand it, and Philip will probably correct me, it's 0.25%. On, you know, so incredibly cheap um, money for the university to finish out the project. So it's not as if there's onerous repayment schedules being imposed on the university. And um, so, and the other point, just to flag up, is that the, you know, going forward, um, an investment decision makers oversight group has been set up with the Department of Finance, ourselves, SIB, the university, <coughs> just to keep close scrutiny on the delivery of the project and the financing of it. And also the SAB has actually taken security against the project. So th from an executive perspective, I'm very, very comfortable that the university, one, can repay the money, and two, that we've given them sufficient flexibility over the first five years to settle in um, with no onerous payment expectations on them. And I wonder if I could uh, come in as, as well. In terms of affordability for, for the university, that, 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 that 5.7 million actually uh, underrepresents the amount of commitment that Ulster University has been putting into the project. Routinely, we've been putting in £10 million pounds a year that, that, that includes those interest payments and our own contribution uh, into the capital of the, of the project. As we go forwards under the new loan arrangements, it's actually a, a cheaper for the institution in terms of that, that 10 million commitment actually reduces to a, uh, a 6.7 million commitment by the time we take into account the 25 million pounds uh, grant. So in terms of uh, affordability, that's a much better position. In terms of the payment holiday, that payment holiday 
uh, those funds are being refenced into a, a resilience account, which uh, gives us some, if you like, future uh, contingency because of the dynamic context in which we uh, find ourselves uh, in. Additionally, uh, in order to demonstrate the affordability of the loan, we had to put together a financial sustainability strategy that was tested by the external appointed consultants. Um, we took a deliberative um, methodology there of being very cautious on our income lines to demonstrate affordability through what was broadly a worst-case uh, worst scenario. We were then asked to rework that scenario in the context of a worst-case COVID scenario. And so we were, had pre- and post-COVID scenarios. Um, since then, of course, we have a bit more in intelligence as to where we are. We started the academic year. We've uh, recruited pretty buoyantly, and our, our, our position would be a bit better than um, the projections that, that we have forward. So again, I'm, I'm very confident that based on uh, history and indeed go, going forwards, we have a, a, a loan position that's highly affordable for Ulster University. Okay. Thank you, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you both for appearing today. Um, just so I'm clear on the figures, um, uh, the the um, whenever this project was. Um, I could say in February 17, sorry, February 17 is when the EIB support was withdrawn, but the, the initial FTC commitment was 73.5 million from in 13, 14 and 14, 15. That's exclusive of the 125. That's, <coughs> so there was an early, the earlier FTC commitment was 73 point, and that was, okay. On the 125, on the 125 financial transactions capital, um, 25 of that was made into conventional capital, so it's effectively government spending. Um, Whose idea was that? It was you mentioned, Mike, that the executive agreed to this. But did the whose idea was it? Why did it, why was the executive talking about it in the first place? Um, well, obviously, in the run-up to what's called June monitoring, the, the executive was looking at its overall financial position, and they, all aspects of the public sector were hit by COVID, and the the, the imperative was to try and. and um, is the negative impact as much as possible. Okay. So um, one of the issues uh, that emerged was there was capital, conventional capital L available. Mm -hmm. And uh, from our perspective in the department, um, we made a bid to the executive saying that any additional conventional capital that went in would ease the repayment schedule confronting the university. We knew that the university, as Paul said, all universities will have challenges because of COVID starting the new academic year. So that was the rationale for putting a bid to the executive and the executive support. Okay. So it was essentially a view that this will make it easier for you to manage the, it's, it's financial, the financial burden of this project. Um, just on um, the, uh, just on the um, issue of, I guess, Perhaps it's opportunity cost is the wrong term. You can correct me. You can, you're an economist, Mike. You can correct me if I'm using the wrong term. But what, and Paul, perhaps you, you have some sort of thoughts on this. What would you, you say the cost of, with the, I guess, focus on this project and also the cost overruns has been in terms of other activities? I, I, I'd like to answer that and say, um, minimal to nil, which sounds quite surprising, but the initial project costs of £254 million actually excluded the um, financing costs and the interest costs, and actually overall the total cost of the budget, uh, of the budget, overall project budget now is very similar to the original budget that was agreed back in 2008 for Ulster University. Broadly, that's because we've swapped out uh, 130 million pounds worth of interest payments that compound over uh, the 30-year period from the original business case to something that equates more to 15 million pounds uh, in this case. So in terms of an opportunity cost, yes, there's an increased cost for the building, but the opportunity cost for Ulster in the overall project, as it was signed off initially, is minimal. And you'd be fairly confident that none of the um no other areas of uh, university activity. i thinking, obviously, of something like develop expansion at McGee have been um, come at the cost of the Belfast campus. 
Well, there's two ways to look at that. In terms of absolute terms, there's still a lot of money that's been spent on, on Belfast, and that's expenditure that, that we could say at, at any point could be spent elsewhere. The judgment back in uh, two, 2008 for the business case was that we had a Jordanstown campus that was beyond, beyond um, the, the, the lifespan of the, of the building and needed to be replaced. The, bi the, bil the business case ascertained that a new build in Belfast was the best option and the most economic option for a range of reasons that I can talk to further if you would, you would like me to. Um, so yes, there's an there's a opportunity cost to building any building. What I'm confident of saying, though, that there hasn't been an opportunity cost in terms of the overrun on, on the building compared to the original budget because of the vastly different um, implications of the interest rate that we've secured with SIB compared to the commercial rates that were projected at that time, not long after the economic crash and interest rates were, were reasonably high. No, obviously extremely low now, but the, if you were in a situation... So that being said, I appreciate what you're saying about the opportunity costs around the, the, the Belfast campus and how you needed to replace Jordanstown, but is it fair to infer from what you said that given one of the other areas of um, uh, priority or perhaps not priority for the university in the last few years has been expansion at McGee, that there, may, that there will have been meetings at which various plans that have been developed, drawn up, discussed around McGee expansion, that at those meetings the financial pressure created by the Belfast project will have played a part in decisions not to pursue things at McGee? No, I, I, I've certainly not been present in, in any of those discussions, nor do I recognise that as, as, as the university's position. The university uses its capital expenditure and at the same time of committing the 10 million a year that we've done, we've committed uh, other millions into capital builds on, 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 the other, on the other campuses. And in recent years, those builds would, would uh, amount to about 40 million pounds worth of, of capital investment. And we would continue to want to do that. Indeed, going forwards in relation to preserving and, and bolstering campus balance, the Belfast proposition in terms of securing our income for Ulster University, which is a unitary organisation, is entirely about being able to support the mission of the entire university, which of course has that regional mission with its multiple campuses to support. I appreciate what you're saying, but, but I mean, I, I suppose I'm still not entirely convinced that an organisation where there are, have clearly been acute financial issues around this project, to the ex, you know, as we've discussed, and that have led to decisions around the Northern Ireland executive deciding to convert what was essentially a financial transaction, a loan, into a grant. There are lots of EU students who'd like to have loans converted into grants. That at no point would, uh, would that have had an impact on the de decision making around other priorities, such as expansion at uh, McGee or indeed other ones. It just seems. Expansion, expansion of McGee in relation to this isn't, isn't critically dependent on that capital expenditure that's in, in Belfast. There's a myriad of other factors in terms of the demographics of, of, of school leavers, in terms of the mix of courses, in terms of uh, just the way that we, we, we structure what we do. Most of what we do will be demand-led in terms of McGee. That, but that would be... But the implication there is that... Um, is that that the decision is around that you, there, you, for whatever a number of other reasons, strategic reasons, strategic reasons around demand, you believe it's better to expand in Belfast or it's that expansion of Belfast at this moment. Not at Belfast all, actually. LA, very you know, keen on the city, but that that is um, uh, that that makes more strategic sense now. Uh, no, and indeed, it, 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 it's the opposite, if I, if, if I may. Uh, a, a critical point here is that the uh, Belfast campus actually comes with 20% uh, less floor space than, than Jordanstown. Jordanstown already has its number of students and staff amounting to some 15,000, which will decant more or less into Belfast. At that point, Belfast will be full. Any future growth, by definition, will need to go onto our other, other campuses. As part of my strategy in terms of that investment, I think there is a degree to which we can utilise the new asset to segment the market. There is an international offering that I think that, that Belfast uh, offers. All of our campuses offer an international, um, an international offering, but Belfast is particularly strong in that regard. As It's also close to a, the, the major population centre for other aspects of non-regulated learning. Uh, in terms of the postgraduate space, for example, and it creates for us an opportunity to grow non-regulated income on that space. 
as we're able to grow provision in the non-regulated space, we will absolutely have to consider the best use of the floor space in that, in that building. And I would absolutely anticipate that, 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 that growth, by definition, will be at the other campuses, and that is absolutely part of the strategy. In terms of uh, growth at the other campuses, we are, we are making uh, headway at McGee. We will make some headway in, in Coleraine, and I have an absolute responsibility to ensure that all of our campuses are viable and, and vibrant, and I'm all too uh, uh, aware of the, the imperatives in the Northwest in particular. Okay. Can I just ask, in terms of the... Um the £125 million pounds loan, Professor Bartholomew, in terms of going forward, um, has the, uh, will it be the, the, the view that of the university, can you provide us with some reassurance, will there be an investigation by the university into how we got into the situation where £125 million pounds loan was needed? Um, and I don't want you to go into any, any area where you're not comfortable or that it may cause difficulty. Um, but I think in terms of the, the public purse and the taxpayer out there, I think they need some reassurance. We need some reassurance around that issue. Uh, and also, what more can you do uh, as the Pro Vice Chancellor to provide confidence uh, that this is good use of the public purse? Because there's obviously a cost. But as others have said, there's also an opportunity cost of what might have been out of this. I think in terms of the, the opportunity cost in terms of the, the, the growth, I don't believe that there is an opportunity to cost in terms of the original, as, as compared to the original budget um, proposition. In terms of the value for uh, Ulster University and, and indeed wider uh, Northern Ireland, uh, we independent um, analysis would put that there's a return on investment of about 3.621. It is an important strategic uh, project in terms of the, the role of education to uh, upskill and to boost productivity within Northern Ireland, and, and we should see the fruits of that over the funding life of the project. In terms of any investigation into the reasons why, I feel we already have a, a, a good understanding of the reasons why. There have been external uh, re reviews that have described that, that process. Um, I, I, we may have an opportunity this afternoon to go into some of the, 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 the details uh, about that. I, I, it's, not, it, it's not a particularly complex story. Um, it is one that I think is reasonably well, well very well understood uh, by us. I think it came out of some very specific choices that we made in the early part of the project. And from that point forwards, there was some inevitability in terms of where we are now. Well, was, it, was it per budgeting, per projections, per estimation? Um, and can I just ask, then, you talk about external reviews. Who conducted those? I believe there was one sponsored by the department that was conducted um, by uh, Deloitte, and then recently uh, we've had reviews conducted um, through through uh, SIB, uh, and uh, there would have been some some history of the projects that had, had, had gone over through through there. Yeah, um, and around the issues of the, I mean, was there was there the competency competency there around these these issues in terms of the projections, in terms of. The, the, the budgeting and in terms of the rotations, uh, all of that that would come in, with, with a major, huge uh, investment in a construction site such as that. In, 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 all, in all of the reviews, and, and we commissioned one by P, PwC, uh, all, all of those review, re reviews found that the um, programme um, team uh, were capable and competent. Okay. Finally, before I bring others in, can I just ask, you had an absolutely superb suite and set of sports facilities uh, at Jordanstown and a real centre of excellence there, not least in around injuries and so on. What, what will happen to, to those facilities? And if there's displacement from those facilities in East Antrim, where will those facilities be found uh, in the Belfast Basin then? Uh, we will retain those facilities. The intention of we retain those facilities at Jordanstown for the use of the of the, of the Belfast campus. Indeed, there is an allocation within the overall project um, budget for some refurbishment of of some end. There's some demolition, as you can imagine, for the wider um, Jordanstown campus. 
but um, we also need to make some investments to continue to ensure that those sports facilities uh, remain for our students and uh, indeed opportunities for community use. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. <coughs> Again, thanks for your evidence so far. Um, you've mentioned a segmented contract. Um, what was the value of the initial contract to build the basement? The initial value of the um, basement. I'm afraid I don't have that figure to to hand. I know I know what the figure I know what the figure was for the reparations in the basement when when that first went in. But I don't have the figure to hand for what the original the repair basement one. Cost. Um, I. I, I I wonder whether that's commercially sensitive okay, at, this, well, at, the, at this stage. Okay, but, um, I appreciate that. Um, I find it very, very strange that um, you know such a large contract would be broke like this. Um, mm -hmm. You yourselves have a, a building uh, specialism within the university and a business specialism. Do you appreciate in doing so you've introduced huge risk? Indeed, and I, I, I think if we were to look back in, in, in retrospect, it's the, the thing, uh, and, and, and when I said that there was you know, something that we did that had ramifications that we live with, that's indeed what I'm referring to. That's not to say that it wasn't with a, a, a rationale, and I think it's perfectly appropriate to share the rationale for the splitting of, of, of the contract. Within Northern Ireland uh, at that time, the number of firms who indicated that they might be interested in the tender were quite, quite low. So there was a sense that the decoupling of the basement works with the superstructure might actually allow us to uh, a, a attract a greater range of uh, bidders for the su superstructure main building, having got the, um, the basement out of the way. And in many ways, it, 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 the decision taken was meant to mitigate some risk for the project in separating uh, that out and allowing us to have greater competition into the super superstructure uh, build. There was also an, an advantage of ensuring that given the length that such procurements take, that the groundworks could be undertaken in parallel then with the substantive procurement process for the main building. So I think that there was a, a, a logic to the intent, but the ramifications given that um, the basement uh, quality was, was not as it should be, required some reparations and um, then folding into the main contract at a later point um, certainly had ramifications. The indication you, you didn't have, you weren't aware of the precise figure of the initial uh, basement contract, but I take it it's not commercially sensitive of what its initial contract yeah. was. Is that commercially sensitive? What do you mean in terms of the, that? the initial build, the, the first basement build, <coughs> foundation build, which was a separate contract? Is it sensitive of what its value was? That was a separate contract, which I, 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 I don't know whether it's sensitive because okay. there's still ongoing um, legal okay. disputes um, to this day in relation to 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 the to the basement. Appreciate that. I, it's just the case I don't have that figure in, in front. In of terms me. of s splitting the contract, uh -huh. <clears throat> um, who all was party to that discussion? Was the department involved in that? Was SIB involved in that? Who took that decision? Because that was, to me a very, very significant failure it, early on. It would have been the university. I mean, at, at that point, universities are autonomous institutions, and at that point, the relationship between um, DfE and ourselves would have been one of regulator and university, as opposed to, uh, w w along with SIB lender. And as such, um, there, 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 there wouldn't have been much um, discussion between the, the, the university and um, DfE at that time. The relationship would have been um, quite, quite different. There would have been regular updates in terms of uh, what was going on in relation to that, but it would have been seen as a university project to be managed by the university. And how much public money was going into that project at that time? At that time, I think the, there was, uh, had been a bid for, I think, £16 million of grant funding, which had been committed at that time. It would have been reasonable, Mr Brennan, for the department to put conditions down to, to monitor and, and supervise the, the project. Would that not be the case? No, at that stage, you know, £16 million of grant in a project totalling somewhere in the order of £250 million was quite small in, in those days. So a business case would have gone to the old Department of Employment and Learning. But as, as 
Paula said, you know, the university is an is independent autonomous organisation, so <coughs> it wouldn't have been um, a significant degree of scrutiny back in 2010 as to, you know, the costings or the robustness of the delivery that was for the university to take forward. The, the, the old department wouldn't have had any insight into, you know, the, the, the mechanics of the delivery of the basement as opposed to the superstructure and the costings of that. They just give the money away for the, the university to do as they wish then? The university made an application for grant funding and, and the department at that stage approved it. Okay. <clears throat> um, but I, the point I'm highlighting is that uh, it's very, very significant error was made at that early time. Uh, and thereafter, all the difficulties that have, have followed. And it would be interesting, we'll find it later, the proportion of funding in the initial build of the basement compared to the additional costs that are now uh, we now find. But we'll find that later. Um, at some point then, the European Investment Bank uh, funding was lost because of delays. Uh, I understand the European Investment Bank would have brought a certain amount of financial expertise with it. Uh, can I ask Mr. Bartholomew how that void was uh, sought to be filled? In terms of the financial um, expertise. E e expertise. I mean, I think in terms of um, the, the way in which we had o o oversight of uh, funding, once again, I think we would have uh, relied on our, our, our own uh, services through the Chief um, Finance Officer and indeed through oversight from, from Council. Would it be right in saying the University has never had such a large project build experience ever before? You would be correct. And uh, were there any alarm bells going with the Department? or SIB, that such a large-scale project, can I ask Mr Don, Donnelly, were, were you, uh, did you not have some concerns that such a large build project was proceeding without any previous relevant experience? Uh, uh, Mr Beggs, the, when the project started, um, SIB had no involvement. We were really brought in when the project had experienced difficulties, and our role was to unpick and understand those difficulties, assist the university to solve those difficulties, fund the project, um, conduct diligence on the loan that we've subsequently uh, made to the University of Ulster, and put in place a monitoring regime that was robust and appropriate to make sure that things were um, scrutinised appropriately and proportionately going forward. Okay. Can I then ask the question, who was monitoring the build and taking these crucial decisions? Was it... Uh, individual employees? Was it the university, the, the council of the university? Who was closely monitoring everything that was happening and taking the crucial decisions? In, in terms of the um, building, certainly it would have been um, the, the, the university with some externally appointed uh, con consultants. Who, 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 was it an individual? Was it an employee? Or was it the council being given all the relevant information? I think it was a combination of those things. There was a team that was working on it, a very ex experienced team, actually, that was working within the build. When I answered your question earlier, it, I, I, I took it to mean in, in relation to the financial um, oversight rather than necessarily uh, the, the, the building oversight. The building oversight uh, would have had a, a, a team, an experienced team of um, construction project managers who were involved in that. Certainly, the university's uh, SLT would have conducted um, some oversight in relation to that, as would the university's um, council. Any large-scale um, build, civil engineering build, is very closely monitored and checked for quality. Can you explain why the defects that we've been ta uh, talking about were not picked up? after that initial basement build? Uh, the, 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 there is, um, that's one of those things that I would like to cover in closed session, okay. potentially, because it, it would be subject okay. uh, to, but there is more information I could give. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Pastor Vaughan. <clears throat> and the follow on. In phase two, Defects in the ground basement works were discovered. Were these defects possibly caused by having separate contracts for the basement works? I, I don't think they were necessarily caused by just being in the, the, the a, a separate contract, but the, 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 the conflated nature of having defects in the basement as part of a split contract had its own, if you like, special pain. Okay. 
And what reason can you give me for having separate contracts for the basement work? Um, yes, and I, and, and, uh, I, I hope that I'd, I'd um, I'll refer back to what I said, said before. The, the logic behind that was to um, do some work um, in, in parallel to allow the ground works to, to start while in parallel going out for substantive procurement for the superstructure, but also, if you like, to de-risk the superstructure contract to have taken the groundworks out of it to make it more uh, attractive to a greater range of um, companies that would take on the larger aspect of the build to allow us to have a larger number of bids to make it competitive. So the groundworks were, in fact, more complicated? With the groundworks, I mean, I'm not a structural engineer and couldn't, couldn't talk to the complexity of it. I, I would just say that where we got to in terms of the, the groundworks, there were remaining issues that needed to be resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask, when did the University's Council become aware of the problems? Um, they became aware of, of um, the, the, the problems um, sh shortly after they, we became uh, aware of them. I don't have the precise uh, week in front of me, but I can give uh, assurances to the committee that since I've been in the role, that's something that I've gone and, and checked at and can see that, that council were uh, apprised. They were first, I think, uh, uh, apprised of um, some some delays in finishing, and then um, as the sign-off period for the groundworks went through, uh, it, it would have been signalled. It was signalled to to council. That and they signed issues. it off. Say again. And they signed it off. Uh, it wasn't for the. Um, it, it, there, there was a company that that, that that signed off on the groundworks. Did the council have representation on the company? In the company. Did the council have? When you say a company signed off on this, did the university have representation in that company by via the council? No, no. That would have been in terms of the quality of the of the work done. That would have been a commercial uh, 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 arrangement, as I, I believe would be uh, typical for such projects. Mm. Would it have been, or going forward, would it be a suggestion that perhaps there should be representation from the university's council on such a body? Um, I don't know if that's feasible. It's not. It's outside the bounds of my expertise. I, I, I would have thought it was an unusual position to be in. There may be colleague, colleagues here who'd be able to speak to that better than me. It's just, if I was a member of the council, and, and I was responsible for the the, the running of the and uh, charge with the running of the university, and decisions were made, being made by a company, and I had no input into that, possibly no knowledge of that. I would like to think that um, because if, it, if the information was, you know, may have been weeks after, I don't know. Um, I would want to know. I think if I was a member of the council, the council should <coughs> want to know. I mean, Mr. Brennan, going forward, if the department was, and I know this um, uh, is always a case when a degree in hindsight would be a wonderful thing, but. Going forward, would in, the, in a scenario like we are talking about now, would that not be something which would be sensible? And I think, Chair, um, it has been addressed to a certain extent. As, as I referenced earlier, there is what's known as a, an investment decision maker oversight group has been set up with a range of key um, public sector uh, players, so the Department of Finance, um, Heather's team, the governance team, SIB. Um, they are all involved um, in, in scrutiny of this, and Heather sits on the strategic uh, group overseeing it. Michael, can maybe say a bit about the terms and conditions that apply to the money that is drawn down? So, from a, from a public expenditure perspective, money will not be drawn down and released unless this group is, is content with it. And as I also said earlier, the SIB have also they are a co-signatory to this, so there are additional checks that have been built into the system. So, from um, a public expenditure perspective, um, money will not be released until we think um, we are confident that sufficient due diligence has been done working with the university. So, so is this group and these checks being put in place because of this particular project and this contract? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Just a couple of questions. In terms of the £378 million, um, does that include uh, an optimism bias? 
I, I'll just correct the figure, if I may, that I think the overall project is 357.9 uh, million. There will be, um, there has, I think, from, from the outset, optimism bias will, will, will be factored into to those and will be, I, I think, go onto the balance sheet as a, as a, as a contingency fund. Okay, what's the percentage of optimism biases in another moment? Uh, I, 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 um, in terms of how that relates to the contingency, that's definitely commercially sensitive, and I would need to take that in closed session. Okay, well, that's no problem. Uh, in terms of the uh, decision to offer um, grants in terms of capital funding um, uh, and instead of financial transactions capital, um, it was mentioned uh, earlier today that that was to help relieve the pressures of COVID. Uh, could you do, tell us a bit more in terms of how that does relieve the pressures of COVID? The 25 million? Yes. Yeah. So there, in June time, there was a range of issues around um, how the university would deliver um, its teaching in the, um, the new academic year that was coming up. And significant work had to be done, for example, in terms of virtual online teaching. Um, investments had to be made by the university on that and applications for teaching resources. So uh, COVID's had a range of impacts upon the university that all have um, resource consequences. Okay, so what was meant to happen was a loan under the financial transactions capital. That wasn't given. And what was happened is that grant funding in the form of capital funding was given towards the cost of a new bill. So how does that alleviate the cost, the immediate cost of COVID? Well, it wasn't the case that the university needed the 125 million in June. Okay, so um, the issue was what is the balance going to be between capital Dell and FTC? And as I said earlier, um, moving um, 25 million capital Dell eased the 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 repayment schedule and the the burden of debt repayment on the university. There was no um, negative impact in terms of the university at that point in June. Yeah. Um, so when would those loan payments have been payable then? If the FTC had proceeded rather than Dell Capital? Well, say the, the loan, re loan repayments are, say there's a holiday of five years on the loan repayments. Right. So wouldn't immediately have then had a benefit in terms of the current situation with regards to COVID? No, but it means that when in terms of the financial reprofiling that the university will do for this project going out over many, many years, they don't have to factor in from year five on a higher repayment schedule. Okay, because my understanding around what we were told earlier that would have an immediate benefit in terms of the additional cost of COVID, but this is more of a long-term benefit? Well, it means that they can alter their, rep their financial profiling and obviously that would impact on this academic year as well. Okay. To me, it strikes that there was Dell capital available and the, they were struggling to spend it, so they decided to allocate it to the Ulster University. That's what it strikes it to me, is what's happened here in relation to that. And uh, there was an easy way to be able to spend the money because there's an endemic problem in terms of being able to spend capital funding. And that's why the FTC amount was reduced and Dell capital was awarded. And I think that's my view in relation to that. In relation to the Dell um, uh, capital grant funding and the FTC. Um, was there a condition associated with both of those uh, or either of those in terms of the future expansion of the McGee campus? No, that is, as I said, you know, this was about the uh, giving money to the university to secure the Greater Belfast development. So there's been no conditions associated with the further expansion of the Austria University? Well, not directly, but, you know, this key issue here, um, and as we went into detail in March, was um, if the Belfast development had not been secured, then there was an issue around the financial viability of the university. So that would have had an impact. If, if for example, the financial viability of the university was called into question, that would have had an impact on the other campuses of the university. Okay. And in relation to the overall business case for this, was that predicated upon capital receipts for the Jordanstown campus? Yes, there was a there, there was a um, component in there for the original business case on capital receipts from Jordanstown. And have they been realised? Um, no, we still have the Jordanstown um, campus, and we will 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 have um, the totality of that through till um, 2022. So we're not quite ready to go to the market yet. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, just to allay any fears, you need this, the, the, the 25 million is born from the university's financial sustainability strategy. We asked them to scenario plan for COVID impacts. Um, and as a result of sort of the reduction in likely conference income, international student income, um, and other incomes that you know uh, help uh, sustain the university. That that's that's effectively where the twenty five million comes from. It's, it's a cumulative position over the next three years, uh, and obviously that's critical because one of the uh, conditions within the loan relates to the university building up, as uh, Paul had alluded to earlier, a, a almost like a, a reserve pot, um, and there was a risk then that the university would potentially not be able to meet that particular condition as a result directly of COVID. Um, so that's just a bit of additional background on the specific on the 25 million. Okay. Mr. Muir, you, does that include your questioning? Well, it gives some clarification, I must say, in relation to the 25 million that appeared in a monitor round statement and finding out more information around that has been like getting blooded of a stone, really, to be honest, because it was just it appeared in a line in a statement in terms of what happened around that. And so I appreciate the clarification that's been given around this, but yeah, I think there's further questions to be asked in closed session. Okay, Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Sir, and thank you for letting me back Very in. Briefly. I appreciate the, the commentary in relation to the 25 million, but you know, this is case study 10 of major capital done by the audit office, looked at by the public. That's, that's the, and that's why I asked in the context of the monies. But I just want to go back, I'm glad the oversight body because right, we were going to ask that question. But just back to yourself, Paul, because I mean, and I recognise the autonomy of the university and all of that, but and hindsight is a wonderful thing. But looking back on it now, I mean, could you say that the capacity was there within the council to run a project as big as this? Well, I, I, don't think, I don't actually think it's for council to run the project, it's to, for council to, to ensure that they have confidence in the executive and the project team that they are running the project and I think in terms of the the, the data that was a, a available to all, all parties I think that they were indeed able to discharge that 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 governance no I appreciate that but, but let's tease it out a bit I mean if I was building a house and I got a contract and got a price and I was project managing it, and that's okay that's up to me but you're offering a major product and, and with that product is public spend and investment and everything goes along with I'm just saying, I'm asking it in that context. This was a major, major project. And, and looking from a public spend uh, and a public um, product, which is a university and, and students and all that, you know, a project manager you should have been up to the level. And obviously, hindsight's a wonderful thing we've learned, but, but that's the way it comes out in the report, you know what I mean, in terms of all that. And, and obviously, we have an oversight body, but just. And I, uh, at, at this point, even with hindsight, <coughs> I, can, I can look back at the Ulster University um, project team and I think have, have confidence in their abilities. Yes, I think that there was a curveball that was um, thrown in relation to the basement, which had uh, ramifications. In terms of the governance, I think I do accept, and indeed it's something that, that came out through the, 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 rev the reviews, that we might be light in our gov governance in terms of uh, expertise within the construction sector, and indeed some of the recommendations from the review that we undertook with the appointed consultants was that we would bolster that commercial expertise uh, in relation to council, and that we would set up a, a special subcommittee um, of council specifically to conduct oversight for GBD with some co-optees from the construction sector. We think that that's a particularly good idea. I think it will allow for more focused um, governance in relation to that project. Uh, in, indeed, as we go forwards as a university in years to come, I think we will set up bespoke time-limited subgroups of council to oversee the governance of other, other projects. So we're currently working on the terms of, of, of reference for that, that subgroup and we'll convene it as soon as soon as we can. And that's a direct response really of the institutional learning in terms of having some specific expertise within the governance rather than a much more, I suppose, general governance um, arrangement whereby 
appropriate challenge was was given of, of the of the executive uh, in relation to 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 the project. Okay, thanks, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Very briefly, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to ask again on the twenty five million. Um, so, the, tw the twenty five million was converted into capital Dell in the June monitoring round. Um, based on a projection of um, how COVID would impact on um, the university's finances over the sort of profile period of FTC repayments and part of the broader um, effort to improve its finances, it was converted into a grant, public spending, um, because it was thought that effectively COVID would hit the university's finances. But you said, Professor Bartholomew, that it has hit the university's public finances, COVID, less than you previously anticipated? Certainly, in, 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 in this year it has. There's certain specific payments. What, what I think that um, we didn't necessarily uh, ascertain, we were asked to um, identify some costs, and I think they turned out to be quite accurate and, and are of, um, in, in the order of about five million in terms of loss of trading and so forth. But given that we're a multi-campus institution, we have, uh, um, for, for example, um, a lot of our campuses are, have, have been shut down over the summer because they were uh, deserted. We have got a lot of estate. We saved quite a lot on heat and power. Mm -hmm. We had quite a lot of savings on our intercampus travel, which we have to support as our ongoing basis. Um, th there may be members of the committee here that have heard me speak before in relation to how our, our multi-campus provision is, is not... Um, is not part of our, our funding arrangements, and we would estimate that to be £15 million a year. Well, when our, your campuses are more empty and people aren't travelling below them, there's a proportion of that that comes back in, in, in savings to us. So there, there have been some savings, but they have been offset by trading, uh, trading difficulties in relation to refunding students for accommodation, the catering, uh, not, not selling anything, uh, and, and, and so to speak. But this is really early days uh, at this stage. We know where we are in recruitment now. Until we get out of this uh, academic cycle, we won't know what proportion of that student income that has come in that we will keep. We don't yet know what the longitudinal uh, aspects of, of, of this will be as we, as we go on into the next academic year and so forth. Understood, but the 25 million was not, therefore, a direct, there's no direct um, relationship between the 25 million and your projection of costs from COVID. I, I think it relates in terms of the overall sustainability um, uh, position. Certainly, having the um, the grant as opposed to the uh, a proportion of uh, as a proportion of the FTC releases money yearly because of the repayments go down by about a million pounds. Actually, would I suppose to ask a fairly blunt question of both you and the permanent secretary? Would it be more transparent to say that the purpose of converting the 25 million? from a loan into a grant effectively was to create, to ease the more financial pressure on the university more broadly and specifically and solely ascribing it to COVID is not quite the full picture. COVID may have been the one factor, but certainly was not the predominant or sole one. Or tell me if that's unfair. I, 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 I certainly think that, you know, we are in a COVID context in which the university operates in. Yes, there are implicit and explicit impacts of that, but I think, as uh, Philip um, picked up earlier, it was part of making the sustainable financial strategy work as part of a package. I think that is a yes. Okay. Um, can can I, just... I possibly add something to this? Yes, sure. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> It's important to say that when the 25 million grant has been approved by the executive, it has not yet gone through our formal approval procedures. Um, so it's there and available, but we will have to go through a process, a casework committee, to ensure that the 25 million um, is going to be appropriately allocated. So the university doesn't have that 25 million yet. They have, however, been able to draw down FTC. So the 25 million is still not final figure. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask, uh, Professor, in relation to I represent North Belfast, so you have communities that uh, abut this development, which I drive past every day and drove past today, and it, it's now coming on a pace, which is good. 
although I have to say I am sad at the loss of some of the old buildings that 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 had to make way for it. Um, but in terms of the communities in New Lodge, Carrick Hill, Brown Square, Cathedral Quarter, and indeed Belfast Chamber of Commerce, are you continuing to engage with those people in terms of the development and particularly the community benefit that there will be going forward from the facilities that you will have there for those communities? Indeed, uh, we are. I'd, I'd have to say I think that there has been some impact there in relation to COVID just because of things that we would have been doing in terms of engaging the community in the projects. We, we had, for example, thought by now we would be actually taking groups of, of community members around the building, showing that that's just not possible under the, the COVID restrictions that we now operate in. But nonetheless, we've got a very active um, provost at the campus who takes responsibility for... Who's for who is that? Uh, that? That's Professor Rafi Foley. Okay. Um, who, who, who coordinates uh, a lot of those uh, activities. We also uh, have had um, a pro-vice-chancellor for the GBD development, Professor Alistair uh, Adair, who <coughs> had been responsible for a lot of the um, campus uh, interfacing. It's tremendously important that the, it's a campus that's in its place of its place and supports the, the community. Indeed, it was part of the original um, business case in terms of associated benefits of, of, of that site, of the value that it would bring to, to the community uh, in terms of where it's placed. Okay. Um, if no other member has any other questions, uh, I would propose that at this stage we will go into closed session. Uh, the public session now ends. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.